mitosis virus can infect 10 to the 12 cells in six days. Uh, one infected cell makes 100 by day one times 100 by day two times 100 by day three, four, five, six. By day six, you have t uh, 10 to the 12, six times 10 to the two. Uh, that's enough. Uh, that's about a third of your blood now is infected by mononucleosis virus. And you have the symptoms of chronic fatigue and all these things that come along with this. Except HIV, it doesn't seem to do it that fast. It waits about five or ten years. But flu or herpes or, 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 or Epstein-Barr virus or Raus sarcoma virus causing a tumor in a mouse or other retroviruses causing spleen weight increases, all of them work like conventional viruses. No, only HIV seems to leak, like to wait a lot of time. So the asymptomatic six-day period prior to the disease is called the latent period. It's typically five or ten days for viruses. See, this is just from Google. I just got it from Google a few days ago. And it shows here all these deadly human viruses. All of them wait about five or six or seven or eight, nine days. Some of them a bit faster, some of them a bit shorter. Even the deadly flu viruses, uh, that's what it takes them to build up a, a critical mass of viruses or virus infected cells. They all follow the same rules. Those are the rules of the germ theory of viral disease. How does the immune system catch up with viruses and microbes? During a microbial infection, numerous immune cells, I call them I here just to give you a little bit of an equation showing it's not just wishy-washy, it's very clear-cut. You cannot mess around with the laws of the germ theory too much. They are natural constants that are not very flexible. They depend on the generation time of the cell, the ability of making DNAs and RNAs and proteins, and the innate uh, dependence of it on vi of viruses or that. So uh, the, they, make, uh, they constantly make distinct antiviral antibodies or bacterial antibodies and that are recruited over time. Constantly they recruit more and more, like the immune system typically does. And then it expands those soldiers that fit the enemy selectively. So they co up from one, from one antigen specific antibody to millions, or well, doubling like bacteria in a sense. But doubling like, and it is the only system in the body where in an adult person, a normal cell can clonally expand. The, all the other one, the consequences are, are serious. This is like uh, going to war. The other possibility is a cancer cell. And that has very deadly consequences, as you know. So the immune system uses that to record a lot of soldiers in a short time. And you can write this roughly formula. The immune systems at n days would be immune cell number one, two, three, four, all have different angles at the, anti at the invading antigen in per two, per two to, the t to the number of days divided by 12, that's half, uh, sorry, that's t uh, 12 hours, that's half a day. So every day, every one of them doubles, but by the time you have hundreds, and on top of it, these guys are not just working with their arms and hands. They have rifles and bullets. They shoot out, many of them, not all of them, the B cells particularly, hundreds of antibodies per day. Every single of those cells can make hundreds of antibodies per day. So within weeks, the multiplicity of distinct immune cells and their ability to make numerous antibodies, antiviral or antibacterial bullets per cell, make up for the initial disadvantage of lower Microbial of, of lower than microbial replication rates. Initially, the, blitz, the blitzkrieg is, is, is won by the attackers, by the microbes replicating faster, but then the immune system catches up. In corn ups, the immune cells are the only ones, besides cancers, if you happen to have that, with the potential to grow exponentially on demand. So summing up now the laws of the germ theory, and germ theory explains the exponential rise and falls of microbial diseases within weeks and epidemics within months as blitzkriegs between microbes and blitz defenses by the immune system. A little less blitzy than the attack, but in time to save most of us. Initially, the attackers have the advantage of several days or weeks until the immune system is focused on the new enemy. Within these weeks, the host's immune cells typically overcome the invading microbes by clonal expansions of numerous microbe-specific immune cells, making hundreds of microbe-specific antibodies each per day.
If there is no immune system, however, like in nude mice, that's an experimental system mouse that has it's a born immunodeficient patient, or in humans with inherited or acquired immune deficiency, the host is killed within days after infection. The, the nude mouse, if it gets infected with any of the common strains of viruses or bacteria, is dead within a few, uh, a few days. And you probably remember in the newspapers of the, about the bubble boy. There was a boy born. Often it happens relatively rarely, but it does happen without a thymus. It's without T cells and B cells. And the immune system had to live in autoclave, with autoclave food in the bubble chamber. It was actually the son of Divita, who was the director of the Cancer Institute until recently. And he lived for 12 or 15 years until someday he got uh, contaminated, whatever it was, Hamburg, and gone he was. Uh, beyond therapy. So um, the, this balance between the microbes and the immune system is a classical Darwinian system. By selecting for immunity, the microbes ensure the persistence of their hosts. They keep selecting out people who, or animals, who have an ad adequate immune system to resist them. If they didn't, we would top our immune system our time, over time, and the next microbe would eat us all up. But by by selecting for good immune systems, they also keep us going and because they need, us for the, they need us for their own replication. Their job is done by the time they have infected a couple of million or trillion cells or billion cells. Those are small numbers in cell business. Then they have made no, more of their own and they can infect the next guy. That's their business. And ours is to survive. If this balance is maintained, then they can go and we can go. And that has been going on for millions of years, including our interactions with HIV between monkeys and blacks and whites and homo and hetero and bi and trisexuals and all those. All these gallo fantasies have been acted out for centuries without causing AIDS until Flossie Wangstall, Bob Gallo, Robin Weiss and Kalishman observed the situation and interpreted it. So the, now, by the time the polio epidemics were solved, were solved the, and the vaccines, with the vaccines of Sark and Sabine, the germ theory had explained and brought under control virtually all major human infectious diseases. Not solved them all, but close enough. There was no, no, no more microbiological terra incognita left for the microbe hunters to discover and to make curious new viruses. And they were better equipped than any ever before in the history of mankind. There were thousands of them. They had gone to Harvard, to, to MIT, to Berkeley, to Stanford. They had lawyers, they had companies, they had, they, they had everything. But they had no enemies. So here they were, they were like a good army, let's say like the American army. And what are they going to do? They go to Afghanistan or somewhere. Let's bomb somebody. We'll find out well later, once we won or do something like that. And this was the situation, uh, and is now, even now, with the huge overinflated budgets for AIDS and, and uh, for the NIH, as long as you confirm, they have tons of money, but they have no real easy targets to work on. So their next, their only la left, the only thing left for them to hunt was, the, for the microbes hunters, was now to postulate that slow viruses cause slow diseases which were previously thought to be non-microbial, namely cancer, leukemia, neurological disease, Alzheimer's, and of course, AIDS. And that became, uh, could I have the next one, uh, please? Uh, that become, that of course, uh, generated the discrepancies that, that, Terry, uh, that Tracy yesterday alluded to and we are seeing all the time. I think Christian Fiala mentioned it and Lorenzo mentioned it. Uh, so the viruses of flow of self-limiting uh, self diseases like uh, cancer, uh, not self-limiting diseases, like the infectious diseases, they go on no matter what, what's happening, are incompatible with the germ theory of, for several reasons. The viruses, these viruses have three exotic or several exotic properties in common in terms of the germ theory. The antiviral immunity does not limit or cure slow diseases. All the viruses, the human leukemia viruses, the, the so-called cervical cancer virus that just got the Nobel Prize, they get lots of Nobel Prizes lately. Uh, Carlton Geideschek got the first for prions, and then Pusner got another one for prions, for slow viruses in Kuru and Kreuzfeld-Jakob. 
and, and, and now AIDS got prizes. And so so the, these, the, these, the antibodies against these viruses, like the antibodies against the papilloma virus in cervical cancer, don't help the cervical cancer. The antibodies in AIDS don't help the AIDS patients. On the contrary, they say, now you have the antibodies, you take my pills, and we'll see what happens. So it's actually the opposite uh, the effect. And the viruses of these slow diseases are all neutralized by antibody. They are latent or they are defective. Only fragments of nucleic acids can be detected. In most AIDS patients, you'd be hard pressed to find a virus. Even then, the world's leading AIDS researcher, Dr. Gallo, had trouble. He got into, uh, he had to defend his case uh, in a court in the end. Of, uh, he had to get uh, the samples from France because he couldn't isolate them himself. So the same is true for isolating papilloma virus from cervical, cervical cancer, which is now by Nobel Prize is a dish, now uh, the cause of that disease. And the same thing is happening with the leukemia viruses, also from Gallo and from others that are thought, and the hepatitis viruses that are causing, causing liver cancer. All of these viruses are neutralized by antibodies, are undetectable in the slow diseases which they cause. And worst of all, which even Robert Koch would have immediately objected to, the same latent and defective viruses are also found in numerous normal controls. We're not supposed to talk about that too much, but we, f we flaunt 40 million HIV positives in the world, but only a couple of million die from AIDS. So that means 39 million or 38 million doing very well, particularly in Africa, as I'll come back in a, mi in a minute. All of these properties are inconsistent with the germ theory. If it were the microbe that is the cause, the antibody would <coughs> stop it and would uh, cure the disease, and the, anti the viruses would be active, uh, working for their, for their replication and killing their hosts. There is no, there are no, uh, since there are no inconsistencies in nature, the slow virus theory must be flawed. The classical test of a theory or the merits is, is the, are the merits of its prediction. According to the virus, its germ theory, the virologists have predicted correctly, as you would expect if you believe in the, in the very reputable germ theory, right after the discovery of the virus in 84, again, uh, Michael Tracy pointed that out yesterday, that Americans and Europeans would soon be decimated by epidemics of sexually, sexually transmitted virus. Only their vaccines could help. And uh, they were dearly paid and worshipped for that. Since this did not happen, no epidemic, no vaccine either. That should actually, without vaccine, it should have been even worse. But no vaccine came and no epidemic came. They moved forward, as our former president would have said, to Africa, where the epidemics are easier to pass and harder to verify than in the US or in Europe. There you can call somebody, are you really dead? Oh no, I'm still here. But in Africa, it's difficult, you know. They don't have any emails and anything. Bill Gates goes down with condoms and emails all the time, uh, and laptops, but still it's hard to connect. So <laughs> it's easier to get away with an epidemic there than here. So now, to minimize, uh, so now there is a, it, there is a claim well, it did the same virus, as Lawrence pointed out 10 years ago. How come does the same virus that causes nothing in America and in Europe cause these terrible epidemics in, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa? This is actually logically inconsistent because the humans are the same. At least 30% of, of Americans are African. How do you say co politically correct African, African Americans? So I never can remember. Schwarz I, or black, I used to say. Yeah. That was okay, but not, I don't know. But anyway, they would be great controls. They're also exposed to HIV. They should get the same epidemics as their nearly identical relatives in Africa. They don't. As long as they stay in the US, they're fine. But if they go to Africa and are studied by Dr. Gallo or Max Essex from Harvard, then they're doomed. And so, <laughs> so that's what they say, at least. That's what they publish. They say they're dying and all the great the obsequious scientific journals, Nature, Science, the New York Times, the London Times, or their Spiegel, uh, repeat over and over, Africa is dying. Everybody said there, I've seen it from my business class window and took pictures. There's a village deserted, all cadavers. HIV was at work. So 
Uh, so what they do, they publish now that there are epidemics of mass 